we're uh, discussing... Dude, I'm what? literally just starting. You're bad <laughs> oh. at this already. I am, I'm terrible. I well, thought, there was an awkward pause. I thought, I thought it, yeah. So let's just say that's... Ev- <laughs> Welcome <laughs> to Politics for People Who Hate Politics. All of my guests are terrible, and I should ban them all, especially Chris. <laughs> And they're, okay. men. they're all men. Uh, they're all men. They're all mansplaining to me as I try to host my show. This is an outrage. That's um, not what we were doing. I need... <laughs> You're all terrible. All right. Welcome to Politics for People Who Hate Politics, episode possibly 14, but I don't know, honestly, at this point. Um, I have some good guests, some old favorites like Joe, my brother, yeah. who does technical <laughs> wizardry for the Stag blog and other blogs and gets little to no appreciation for that. Um, and every once in a while he writes something. And he plays a bass in a band called Act of Pardon, which is kind of a terrible band, but he, but, 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 but he's good at the bass. And they're <laughs> musically gifted. I just kind of hate the music they play. Wow. Thanks. Yeah. Stabbing Keep, me in the back. <laughs> keeping it real. Keeping it real. Um, we have Todd Seavey, who I don't really know the simple summation of his work, but he uh, writes... Libertarian writer, ghostwriter, uh, occasionally TV producer. That's, know. You know what? I knew all that. I don't know why I was saying I didn't. Um, he does all those things. And his blog is good, even though it's too infrequent. Um, and we have JL Aharam, my friend, who writes things and photographs things. Um, and I honestly don't... Tell me what you're up to lately real quick, JL, cause in case you're doing something new or you just... What's give me give me the deets right now? Um, I just started my second to the last semester to, at, at USC, I guess. Um, cool. So I can do that right now. That's good. Yeah. Um, is that fun? Yeah, it's pretty fun. Okay, learning is good. And yeah. we have interrupter supreme Chris Morgan, who I'm going to shame a little bit, but he's also the only first time guest, so that's mean. Um, and he is a writer in New Jersey, and he was a writer for, for um, Biopsy Mag, the zine, but no longer, sadly. Um, but welcome, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. Apologies for the shaky start, and apologies in advance for any and all future transgressions. Um, I'm just glad that that wasn't my fault at all, <laughs> for once. That's good. It's a good beginning. Um, okay. I want to start with sort of a rambly and open-ended topic, as usual, but one that's very fitting for the name of the show, Hating on Politics. And I'm going to tie this to two recent things with the Pauls, um, the old Paul and curly-haired Moppet Paul. Um, Ron Paul, or rather the Ron Paul Institute, which is sometimes a dodgy organization affiliated with some a few people that... Anyway, they published an, a conspiracy theorist mongering article recently um, about the, the Charlie Hebdo massacre in Paris. You know, sort of like the classic sort of not thinking very hard, just asking questions, was it a false flag type thing. Like your basic idiocy. Um, and that's annoying because you know, obviously it makes you know Ron Paul look dumb and outlets from Salon to the Blaze kind of jumped on and were like, oh my god, libertarians are being crazy again. And also, we had some controversy, which honestly shouldn't count as controversy, but it does, with Marion Copenhaver, who actually made the logo for this very podcast um, and seems pretty awesome, though I haven't met her in real life officially yet. Um, and she's been doing a little bit of social media stuff for the for I almost said the Rand Paul campaign, <laughs> um, the assumed Rand Paul campaign, um, and the Free Beacon, that neocon rag, uh, were the first people to write an article about how she said mean things about Lindsey Graham and John McCain and use profanity about them, and is a self-proclaimed anarcho-capitalist, and basically believes, you know, in a sort of a collection of very unexpected libertarian beliefs. Um, and I kind of want to talk about, like, but both, like, practically whether this means anything for the credibility of libertarians or lack thereof, and also sort of why both of these controversies even though, you know, the Charlie Hebdo false flag one is a little more legitimate to me, 
why they're both sort of signs of the bullshit of politics, you know, making making something out of small things, whereas, you know, people like Lindsey Graham want to go to war every five minutes, and somehow that's not quite as offensive. Joe, start us off with something here. Um, well, libertarians don't really have any credibility, so we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> that's not an issue. Fair enough. Um, but, I mean, first you had... I don't know who at the Washington Free Beacon. Uh, a Sonny woman named Dick Alana Bunch. Goodman, I believe. Uh, None of okay. the, not the usual offenders like Sonny Bunch. Like that's even a real name. Like he's even right. a real person. Well, anyway, you know, they were gonna bring this up, and then of course I saw from Eliz Olivia Newsy or whatever her name is, in the Daily Beast asking the question, "Will this hurt Rand that Paul?" Well, yeah, of course it's going to hurt them because they're going to keep bringing it up and they're never going to let it go. Mm -hmm. and some, you know, we'll forget about it, and then during the campaign that we all assume is coming, you know, this kind of stuff will pop up again. You know, is he too libertarian? Is he too isolationist? And you know, it probably, I mean, it shouldn't hurt him, but you know, people are going to talk, and the usual neocon BS will bring it up whenever it's useful to them. I, I think uh, having the two controversies happen at the same time uh, is actually educational for the world and for libertarians and a reminder of why I think Rand Paul is superior to Ron Paul uh, in that uh, basically regardless of what po uh, people's political impulses are uh, this is a case where uh, e each of these controversies uh, is won or lost on the actual empirical merits of the claims being made. Uh, there's no proof of the Charlie Hebdo conspiracy, so if, right, you, obviously, yeah. if you embrace that, you're kind of crazy. Uh, by contrast, <clears throat> one of the things Alana Goodman uh, was mocking the Rand Paul affiliated blogger for was saying that the Pledge of Allegiance was written by a socialist. Right, well, right, right. It, it was. It that's, was. That's a course. great example of conservatives <laughs> thinking they know history better than libertarians and that they're the inheritors of tradition and so forth and not really knowing even American history. Uh, so Rand Paul can win that one and even educate people about how deep the socialist streak in American history, unfortunately, uh, goes. Uh, I say if Rand Paul should bring up Alana Goodman uh, and the mistakes the neoconservatives made at every possible opportunity, whereas Ron Paul saying, ah, I don't mind some conspiracy theorists and religious crackpots is not helpful. It's not. I know it's not. I would never argue that it's helpful. You know, even Justin Raimondo, bless him, is not, you know, is not, never happy to see things like that. He stopped following me on Twitter, by the way, and I'm, I'm not sure why, but I, at first I was thinking, like, oh, it must be something negative I said about that. <laughs> about Pat Buchanan or something, but I have a new theory. I think he was upset because I made a joke about Auburn University, which is across the street from the Mises Institute, having mm. one of the highest, I think it's one of the five highest STD rates of all the colleges in America. I think that might be what upset him. That's an amazing <laughs> tangent. I can't, Justin tolerates my insubordination, but let's not go down any Justin tangents. For, oh, okay, uh... sorry. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Um, I guess for me, with 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 the whole, um, you know, Dan Mike Adams, I'm fo we follow each other on Twitter. Mm. You know, he's he he does publish some stuff, uh, you know, from from these from these writers, and and it it is just so unfortunate it happens under it's happening under uh, Ron Paul's name. Um, you know, what what they're doing, what they're doing uh, at RPI, you know, is mostly good. You know, I mean, we can say that it's mostly good. It's you know raising questions about our our uh, our foreign policy that most think tank there are, there there isn't any other think tank uh, think tank out there uh, that's dedicated you know very few that are dedicated to peace. You know, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it does this does you know kind of uh, for me it it raises questions about a uh, judgment in terms of why are they publishing you know credibility destroying. You know, credibility destroying articles. Yeah, uh, yeah. One thing that I suppose has made people more uh, psychologically inclined within the movement to accept this kind of thing is that so many people in the last few years, of course, came into the movement via libertarian conspiracy theorist Alex Jones's uh, radio show. Uh, and I know. 
I think so. I mean, I don't have hard numbers. I wish I did, but that's my impression. Uh, and uh, I like he, he sometimes takes credit for getting the uh, Ron Paul uh, presidential campaigns going because I think Ron Paul gets credit. Oh yeah, yeah. On yeah, yeah. libertarians, you but know. I was gonna say uh, Alex Jones is pushing an even uh, uh, an even crazier uh, Charlie Hebdo conspiracy theory. Uh, uh, he he was running a, a clip on his site that supposedly showed that when they captured uh, or actually when they shot and killed uh, one of the uh, Hebdo gunmen, his hands were already tied up as if he'd been a captive already, and they just shot him for show. Uh, and, and even in their own clip, you can see that although the guy, when he starts running from the cops at one point, uh, his, uh, or we're actually running from some and towards others, uh, his hands are together. Uh, but uh, by the time he stumbles and falls near them, both his hands are widely separated and flailing around. But you'd have to watch really closely to see that. Uh, and I'm not saying everyone should watch the video closely, but the people who claimed it was evidence the hands were tied together probably should have watched it more closely. Like, CB, I don't mean to downplay the fact that there are human beings in the world who take Alex Jones seriously, because there are, and that's a problem. But, I mean, every time something horrible happens, like the kind of people I follow on Twitter are like, oh, Alex Jones is at it again. He says X is a false flag. Like, dude, tell me when he said, like, he says it isn't a false flag, because that is news, and yeah. the rest is just his shtick, you know? What bothers me, and this is actually... Michael Tracy, um, my friend, though I've never met him, it's weird, um, he kind of had a wonderful response to Ron Paul and st this stupid article being published, which is, you know, right-wingers embrace their own arguably more subtle sometimes conspiracy theories in like that, that, that are intended to go to war. Like, I think that, I don't want to say that, like, I'm glad to see this idiotic article under any kind of Ron Paul banner, but it is another one of those things where that somehow just destroys Ron Paul's credibility and destroys all our credibility by extension. And, you know, the, the, like the most staunch advocates of the Iraq War who are still clinging to, like, various myths about it five minutes ago, their credibility never seems to be shattered quite enough. I mean, it's, it's a, there's a convenience in the narrative, even if, yeah, that article was stupid and I wish it wasn't there and someone... Needs to tell Ron Paul to stop tolerating this kind of thing. Uh, and the mainstream conservatives all have also have a fair share of birthers and the like sort of thing too. Right. Yeah. yeah. All the all the Bill Clinton killed the guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those are like the most boring conspiracy theories. Like anytime it's like a Clinton conspiracy theory, I'm just like, I don't care. State yeah. troopers and adultery. Right. Yeah, it's so banal compared to some of the really good ones. Oh, uh, the 90s were more peaceful times. <laughs> <laughs> Except for when we were melting Branch Davidians, you know, on occasion. Well, I just want to go back to uh, Rand Paul's um, hire, uh, hiring of uh, the Libertarian Girl. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the, you know, the, there's two things going on there. First is the, 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 the fact that it's so weird for a liberty-aligned... Um, liberty Align uh, Senator to to have people who are libertarians on his staff somehow just uh, just for somehow it doesn't occur to conservatives that that could happen um, so that that's that's one I mean what's next are they gonna are they going to attack Rand Paul for uh, showing up in a convention where Glenn Greenwald gave a a, a a, a special address to. I'm talking about the the Yale convention, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> so I mean, people were like cheering for Edward Snowden. And that's the thing that that's you know these people from the Free Beacon uh, and the, these people, like Jennifer Rubin don't seem to realize that there is a substantial number of people um, within the Liberty Movement who are working for you know for, for very consequential organizations, Gen Generation Opportunity, Americans for uh, uh, for prosperity, you know, uh, uh, coke-affiliated institutes who are anarchists. You know, they're straight up, uh, you know, anarcho-capitalists or whatever, what kind of flavor of anarchists they are. And you know, it's it's. I just find it so funny that it's like such a big news, and for us libertarians, like that's not really a big deal. You know. I know. I mean, the 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 so. beacon piece. It's like it had the format of a hit piece, mm -hmm. but it wasn't one. That was the weird part. It was like, yeah, look it's at all like, these things she like, believes. And we're like, yeah, we know. <laughs> we believe. Like, because they're, they're normal to us doesn't mean they aren't damaging PR. 
that's what no, that's mind. true. But it's not, I think it isn't damaging. That's the thing. It's like it's same. It's it's like uh, the Glenn Greenwald hit piece that came out. Um, uh, was it last? No, it was two years ago. Remember the GG scandals? And everyone's reading. It's like these aren't scandals. I can't remember those, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Them. Supposedly he had uh, uh what what was it? I can't even remember because it was so inane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, uh, I mocked it. For, for a bit, so... Anyway. The, the Free Beacon piece was like one small step up from something like Chuck Johnson <laughs> whatever would publish. No, and because he so, just writes lies, I mean, as far as I can tell. Like, I, I, by the way, I'm friends, with, I'm friends with both Sonny Bunch and Charles C. Johnson, so... Dude! <laughs> why do I talk to you? <laughs> If you want why to hear, are you so excellent. You know the stupidest people. What? Oh you know no, no. They're, and uh, and they both like sci-fi and comic books, so you know they. Okay, they have, well. They have to be good-hearted people. I like those things too, but come on, dude. I but, drew a cute. I, I drew a cute meme of uh, of a uh, uh, C. I call him C C B baby. C C B B. He what? He I'll, likes to I'll, dig I'll, up dirt by his own admission, and once in a while. You know, there'll be something that's inaccurate, but as you know, as he would say, the New York Times does corrections, and so does he. And sometimes, you know, he gets good stuff that nobody else is paying attention to, and they probably should be. Uh, in the case of Sonny Bunch, uh, he I mean, has I, no soul. No, I think a, a lot of his instincts are sort of libertarian. He just, uh, it, you know, he just thinks our government isn't the only one worth overthrowing. Uh, and I can sympathize with that position. Right. That is way too generous of in, a picture of Sonny Bunch. Good God. It, I admit, it does skew even his impression of comic books at times, though, because he liked the movie Captain America 2, as did we all, but he didn't like the fact that Hydra and S.H.I.E.L.D. turn out to be the same organization. Oh, spoiler. Oh, I'm sorry. I literally have not seen that movie yet, so, oh, no. okay. so, and I read a lot of io9, and I still... I'm not familiar enough with Captain America Ness to have picked up that spoiler. So I'm going to try to forget that. It's like the time I accidentally read Ender's Game spoilers and then forgot it repeatedly, but I still haven't read that book. I, I haven't ruined the window. Bit. I really haven't. Okay. Side note. It's, Sonny Black uh, said you would be terrible at parties, Lucy. Well, <laughs> he's actually <laughs> right about that, so... I wanted to actually tweet him and say, how did you know? <laughs> Were you at my party I threw when I was in high school? When my parents went out of town. <laughs> you should have done that. That would have been really funny, actually. Oh, yeah. Um, I despise oh. that man. I'm sure he'll subtweet you again. Oh, he loves doing that. He's such a little bitch. Anyway, sorry, Todd. I still like you a lot. Um, Chris, They're you both haven't chimed friendly. in. <laughs> I want you to chime in. I'm sure they are, Todd. But well, they're also bad people. I really want to say I've heard about the Ron Paul thing, and I've heard more about the Rand Paul thing. Mm -hmm. And the Rand Paul thing interests me a little bit more just because, you know, Ron Paul's, you know, retired. He's doing whatever. Um, and, you know, I think since Rand Paul is sort of, I guess Rand Paul is trying to go the distance, going to try and go for the nomination. Is that sort of a foregone conclusion at this point? It sort of rather seems that way, yeah. I'd like to see that because I think he'd be an interesting sort of addition to all the other candidates that I've heard about, all of whom are terrible in their own ways. <laughs> um, like my, fa my family's convinced that it's going to be Jeb Bush and it's going to be Hillary Clinton running against each other. And I'm not too excited about that. <laughs> um, and if it's going to be two mo like monstrous people, I want it to be those two because the like, nihilistic joy that I'll take in that, just like, fuck yeah. it, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> Let's burn yeah. it down! <laughs> just want the world, you want to see the world burn. At that point, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if it really turns out that way, we should just burn it all down. Oh, and you can quote me on that if I ever <laughs> help Rand Bush Paul with anything. Oh, my God. But I'd like to, I would like to see, you know, I, I agree with, with Todd. Um, if any American voter is going to pay attention um, about what points were made in the Free Beacon piece and how Rand Paul would like to respond to them, assuming um, if they're going to be brought up again and again, which they probably are. Um, I like to see those debates happen and to have, you know, neocon bullshit answered to in kind, finally, after all this time. And yeah. I think the Pledge of Allegiance is actually a winnable issue because... Hey, well, it's 
factual. I mean, she was completely right. That... And, not, and, not, and not only that, but Rand Paul could actually say, I'm saddened the neoconservatives are so sympathetic to socialism. Uh, look, at, look at how deep the communist rot has become in our party that they're defending this uh, slogan written by a commie. Uh, do they not know, or they? I mean, do they not know? Do they not believe when people have repeatedly said that? It doesn't matter. And this is the thing. And this is the thing that's so funny about it. You know, like it doesn't matter that it was written by a a socialist or a communist. You know, what matters is it's a pledge to it's pledge of allegiance to the flag and America loves the American flag so this 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 conversation that we're having you know America doesn't doesn't care about history it can barely remember what happened like 15 years ago you know or 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 yeah, you know, prior to that totally true. so mm -hmm. I mean the, the fact that it, it, is it going to be a problem I don't think so this whole this this fake controversy it's not going to be repeated no one cares about libertarian girl you know I I actually like I've heard of her, but I didn't realize that she, she was super popular. And as someone who pays attention to the Liberty Movement, how is it like I've never like I don't really know her? You know, I've been asking someone myself. Who is a, that is someone who's not just a celebrity? How come I've never like really you know, heard of her? Like I've she's never seen any social work. media sort of. Yeah, she's like a graphic right? designer and a social media person. Well, that's um, the thing. Like, does it matter? Well, it doesn't matter who she is. It matters that she she's wasn't affiliated. hired for her libertarian views. I'm guessing. I'm guessing she was hired because she's good at social media and she has, you know, which she clearly is, a because ton of damn. social media followers. And you know, I don't think her stance on John McCain really affects what she'll be doing for the campaign, which isn't, you know, ostensibly offering advice to Rand Paul. It's you know, right. she's not like his advisor. And just to be clear, too, I don't think she's uh, she's gonna be working for the campaign. I think she's working for the office. Mm. Like there's the sen there's there's the Senate office and there's Rand Pack. And from what I understand, from how I believe it's Vic it's like uh, a guy named Harris who's running the uh, uh, Rand Pack um, social media stuff. So well, there's something nobody will keep track of, though. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, but but the, this sort of speaks to like the Rand Paul catch, though, which is if he was exactly like everyone else in the potential nominees camp, he there he there would be no point to him. He would be just as you know boring as them, with you know less experience than than some of them. I don't know if that people value governorships more than senator. I don't know. I don't. I don't care. Um, but I mean, like. His libertarian leanings are what make him interesting. His, you know, his his criminal justice, occasionally working with liberals on actually good causes, which is, you know, why he's interesting to me. And if all of that went away, all of this controversial stuff to the beacon crowd went away, he wouldn't be interesting anymore. But obviously, if he's too much like Ron Paul, he's never going to make it anywhere. It's yeah. It's the impossible Rand Paul thing that. This kind of, I don't know. I mean, it's a little <laughs> bit, it, it keeps him in the news, you know. I mean, the fact that, that Free Beacon could, uh, uh, spent the effort to do a, a really stupid hit, hit, hit piece. And the things that we'll, for, we'll forget about it, just just as we've for, mostly forgotten about Charlie Hebdo. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, for the most part, it's like, I'm glad that shit is over, you know, because so, I was tired of it. <laughs> so... <laughs> so it was just too much. It was. It, it, it's gotten to the point. It's gotten to the point where it's like it's like a parody of itself. You know, talking. You know, this this thing about free speech, and next thing you know, France is jailing people. You know, this libertarian yeah. controversy. It's a non-controversy. No one cares. You know, it it is yeah. a rant, yeah. Paul. You know, and and they'll they'll attribute attribute it to her. Uh, you know, maybe unfairly from from. Being a, a a female celebrity on you on mm. on social media. Yeah. Well, the Pauls continue their stuff. Bad. Um, they need a bad manager. I guess so. Um, yeah, both the Pauls have a problem with sort of trusting. Not not I'm not not impugning uh, Marianne at all, but just. 
in other cases, they've, they've sort of you know, newsletters. You know what I mean. Um, yeah. Okay, here's a new thing to talk about. Um, people are freaking out about American Sniper, and there are a lot of right wing trolls who think that American if you. Don't... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and unfortunately, I haven't seen it yet. I actually might go see I, it tomorrow. I have. Okay. Stevie, speak to us. Yeah, but you're you have don't neocon ruin it. sympathies. Don't ruin it like you ruined Captain America for me. Uh, <laughs> wasn't that like two years ago? Uh, yes, it was. Uh, <laughs> yes, he does. Yes, he does. I haven't totally well, ruined Captain America. Cool. And, and also, in my defense, all <laughs> the fallout of the Captain America movie has been going on for like the last season and a half on Agents of Shield. So I just figured by now, like, I have work. a lot of things to watch. Okay. I think her I mean, word would have leaked out by now. But uh, uh, actually, I even I, I accidentally spoiled for a friend of mine the fact that Coulson's not really dead. It was like he's the star of Agents of Shield. I could not know that. But anyway, uh, yeah, he's not really dead. I, I don't know if I ruined that just now for anyone. But um, maybe you, know, you did. I don't know. Well, American Sniper. That's <laughs> arguably more important. Um, uh, you know, I saw it, and I think like several things Clint Eastwood has done. Uh, it's actually very scrupulously politically balanced in that he knows he's got a certain conservative audience, but when the moments of conscience come for the character, they have a tendency to be liberal in a Hollywood-pleasing way, so I don't think there should really be... Uh, leftists should not be freaking out about the movie, um, and if conservatives aren't, that probably speaks well of them, so I, th I think it was a decent movie and fairly balanced. Uh, the oddest reaction to it, I thought, was actually Seth Rogen, of all people, uh, saying that he thought it was a propaganda piece. What wasn't it? Just like yeah. three weeks ago, he did a movie about overthrowing the government of North Korea, and now he's complaining yes. about propaganda pieces. And as far as I know, Clint Eastwood's movie was just created because, like, Clint Eastwood or somebody affiliated with him read the book *American Sniper* uh, by Chris Kyle. Whereas I kind of think the State Department and the CIA were actually involved from the get-go in Seth Rogen's movie. So if either of these is a propaganda piece, I would think it's the Seth Rogen one. Um, I mean, I, I don't know I, I don't know who did the hacking exactly. I'm not saying any of that was uh, faked, but supposedly the CIA was consulting with Sony and the State Department with the producers of the movie. Um, so, I don't know. Seth Rogen's in no position to criticize. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe, he, was, maybe he was projecting when he criticized American Sniper. I don't know. Uh, in fact, I think, you know, strictly speaking, huh. the, the Seth Rogen and James Franco characters in, in uh, the admittedly fictional uh, interview uh, end up causing more deaths uh, than the real-life Chris Kyle does. But in any case, I, I well, actually recommend both movies. I would say spoiler alert, but I have no interest in that movie. I, I recommend, I recommend Seth, both movies, even though they're both propaganda. Horrible combination. There can be... <laughs> uh, yeah, it's true, and... Um, Eastwood, I I remember I I haven't seen his um, Iwo Jima movies since they came out, and I might be more critical of them now because I'm more insane. Um, but I like them both, especially uh, Letters from Iwo Jima, which is actually from the Japanese side. Which it t it takes us six decades to actually realize. Wow, this is kind of an interesting perspective that we don't see much. I mean, in um, Flags of Our Fathers, like you don't see the Japanese at all. And I think you barely see any Americans in Letters from Ujima. I, I honestly don't remember, but you to see make one, that, you see one scene that um, reproduced itself in both films. Uh, yeah, a soldier, an American soldier, getting killed. Oh, you see it from different viewpoints. You see it from before it happens and when it happens. That kind of rings a bell, yeah. Um, and I think just just to make that movie at all, even after all this time, is a little bit of an edge to it. Um, so I, I, I liked Eastwood f for that. Um, I I think pe people who have actually read the book American Sniper, like out of context, there are some really nasty sounding quotes from Kyle. He doesn't sound like he was a good person at all, um, and. You know, being that worse. I don't know. Being that like in awe of a sniper, also sort of. I I don't think a sniper is necessarily any more objectionable than 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 other types of of soldiers. But I don't know. I just 
the 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 right wing people who just seem really just like circa 2004 level of you love terrorist type of response to any kind of criticism to this is weird. I think people are are some people even who they're, they're objecting even to Eastwood's balanced sort of approach and his sort of humanistic approach when Kyle seems to have turned himself into a bit of a caricature and right. seems to have been kind of a pathological liar. Yeah, um, on that same note, I read a piece on National Review from A.J. Delgado who wrote mm -hmm. about, you know, that, I mean, even Chris Kyle may have been a war hero in the standard definition of, you know, what everyone considers a war hero, especially in America, but he also lied about a bunch of stuff. <laughs> he, you know, he actually yeah. he sued, or when Jesse Ventura sued him, you know, Jesse Ventura was right. That's what A.G. Delgado says, and I tend to agree, you know, about defaming him and saying he punched him out. He obviously had a penchant for over-exaggeration. Which means yeah. the conspiracy theorist uh, defeated the uh, the American hero in... in <laughs> <laughs> That's true. We can't have that. But, I mean, um, nobody seems to be able to separate the war hero from the, you know... The guy who may have not been that great of a guy, and it, you know, I think I don't think Clint Eastwood necessarily made. It's not a propaganda piece. I don't think about Chris Kyle. I think it's just a good story that he well, wrote. It, well, that's the thing, though. The the Eastwood treatment of like we're all humans and we're all vaguely tortured by going to war is arguably its own type of slant that you can legitimately object to. I, I don't think the Japanese like that term. <laughs> oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's see. <laughs> God damn it, Todd. Um I mean like yeah, we, we like Imperial Japan is very, very nasty. Um and to make people fighting for Imperial Japan be sympathetic, whereas, you know, any implication that anyone opposing American soldiers in Iraq, they're all terrorists or which Clint Eastwood did oppose American soldiers in Iraq. He opposed them in Afghanistan. He's a right. I like he's Eastwood. The dovish, most dovish person. <laughs> you know. But that, that, that doesn't mean that shows up in the movie or that the movie's not, you know, sub the interpretations of it are not subjective. I don't know. Everyone's terrible at interpreting things, though. That's the problem. In this That's case, I believe everyone is just completely and wildly misinterpreting the movie. I think oh. it's got something for everyone, just like Team America. <laughs> <laughs> I have no opinions regarding the movie because I haven't seen it. Plus, I despise Chris Kyle. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard it. I mean, he he was all over the place, you know, before before he died, and he was a despicable person then, you know. But this whole idea, let's just talk about the the idea of a hero. Um, in terms of, of of like if you look at like the Homer, for example, you know, he's this he's he's our Achilles. You know, he's the guy who is who is really good at what he does, but deeply, deeply dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. You know? So yeah, so yeah, you can be a hero and still have all these flaws. Um and that's what that's what the American public is 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 responding to. And and for the most part, you know, because of Iraq, because of Afghanistan, they, you know, the American public that hasn't really had the chance to have a hero. Uh, we we don't really have, you know, we have the support the troops thing, but these are there's everyone's a hero, so no one is. You know, mm -hmm. everyone that comes that served in Iraq and who's a veteran is a fucking hero. You know, and that's not true. And and and, and it. It it manifests itself in the way the way that people just flock to the to 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 the movie theaters to watch this this film it kind of speaks deeply to the fact that the American public is starving for someone to look up to you know I mean, we we live in an age of no heroes but I mean do they so want somebody the first... from the war on terror specifically to be their hero of the war on terror is it more particular to like these wars that everyone got sick of. Or is it just like a general, like, look, a heroic guy, let's give our money to the maker of this movie? Like, I mean, is it because they want the war on terror to look better or to have meant something? Yeah, obviously. I mean, it's, 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 it's because everyone... It, it, 
I don't want to say that everyone sacrificed for for you know for these for these war, but everyone has paid into it for you know, in one way or the other. The recession, if if you if you believe Ron Paul, for example, is is a ref, is 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 tied directly to our spending in Afghanistan and Iraq, and this and our economy our economy suffering because of that. So for the most part, everyone has some sort of a, a sacrifice in, in in this war against terror. And with our civil liberties being being you know violated left and right, you mm -hmm. know that that is also a, a, a sacrifice in this war on terror. So yeah, it just seems like he was such a bad choice to, like that Eastwood's skills could have been put to better use. Um, you know, I don't know. I feel more sympathetic to like Ira Hayes, um, drunken Ira Hayes, than than I do towards Chris Kyle, honestly, but. I don't know well, because Chris Call would sort of survive, and he was able to publish a book, and he was, you know, and he was a, a shameless self promoter. You know? Yeah, which in itself uh, that's isn't why, that's why, yeah. and that's why he's out there. Um, and he was controversial, and he had he made no, he made, he wasn't he was unashamed in his hatred of of Muslims. Yeah, you know, he was unashamed in his hatred of black people. And the way he 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 brags about, oh, we're gonna sh be shooting people in Katrina, you know, those in 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 New Orleans in Katrina, you know, we're gonna shoot all of Which them. Which he didn't do. I mean, like, so, there's no well, reason to yeah. think he actually was there. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? You know. <laughs> <laughs> um. Mm -hmm. But it's 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 that it's that bravado. It's that it's that. Um, you know, unashamedly American. It's you know, we ha we make no apologies for what we do. You know, people like that. Uh, oh, and, and coming co coming from the, the the heels of this, you know, Sony hack. Um, you know, people just want. I don't know. I suppose if we're worried, can we blame about Obama for this? <laughs> can we blame Obama for this? <laughs> Hashtag thanks Obama. If we're worried about Hollywood producing propaganda, we should probably be troubled by the fact that uh, Chris Kyle's influence is so pervasive that nearly every major Hollywood production has craft services at the end. And, no, I'm uh, sorry, that was an attempt to make a joke involving his Craft International and uh, the craft services food cart they always have. But I didn't get dude, it. It was wow. too obscure in both directions. That was, wow. Even, even I mean, I know what craft services are. No. Oh, that was... <laughs> Okay. That was never going to happen, John. That was <laughs> doubly never yeah. going to happen. Well done. I, I enjoyed it for its lack of working at all. If Dennis Miller were here, he would have appreciated it. That doesn't bode well either. No. Not anymore, at least. Damn. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I feel weird because like, I love the movie Downfall, which is about Hitler. And I think Hitler is... This is going to sound great out of sort of out of context. <laughs> Hitler is a great subject for a semi-humanizing film. Oh god! Because we no no. Have you guys seen Downfall? It's awesome. I've, I've seen Downfall. Yeah. Yeah, it takes place in the Fuhrer bunker. You have the sick, hysterical, crazy Hitler, the ranting Hitler of all those stupid YouTube memes. But you also have the guy, you see him pet his dog, you see him smile, you know, the flashback to him picking his secretary and smiling at the pretty girls and stuff. And you get this really good sense of kind of the Hitler you know, <laughs> and also the Hitler who was a human, you know, as much as it would be easier to think he was a monster. Um, but that works because we know it's a incredibly, you know, it's like the most common historical knowledge probably out there, one of them, that Hitler was this monstrous person. To remind you he was a human being as well makes a good movie. Rand Paul, sympathizing podcast host, sympathizes with Hitler. Um, exactly. It just gets it's worse. Gonna, it really does. This is my uh, collateral against ever selling out. It's everything I've ever said on the internet. I mean, you're um, not totally wrong. I just read this 1,200-page book on Hitler. Nice. And it was quite good. I just wanted to brag. I read it in, like, four days. <laughs> good job, Joe. Well, um... um the one like World War Two era sort of film that I've always appreciated was actually it was produced by uh, I think the BBC, but also aired on HBO called Conspiracy. Um, yeah, I just watched which, that too. Which is about the Vonsi Conference. Um, Kenneth Branagh 
plays um, Reinhard Hedrich, and Stanley Tucci plays um, Eichmann. Eichmann, yeah, Eichmann. And they have, you know, all the other figures who came to Vonsi to sort of coordinate the final solution. And it just takes place in that scene, more or less in real time. Because I don't think the meeting took very long, and all they really had to base it on was one person's notes. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the dialogue is embellished, but it's very, you know, intelligent and quickly paced. And it, but it basically just addresses the uh, sort of the cold efficiency and bureaucracy about how the Holocaust was carried out, how, you know, the concentration camp organizations uh, were made. Um, and that I always found m probably more compelling than uh, Downfall, just because that was sort of the wheels turning. Um, and it's a very, I consider it a legit horror film. Yeah, no it's doubt. A World War II film. And I like, uh, I kind of appreciated um, to a, not the exact same extent, um, but the only, the most recent like War and Terror type film I've seen was Zero Dark Thirty um, a while back. Yeah, which, which I kind of dislike, honestly. I, I had a, I didn't really get the problems with um, the depictions of the enhanced interrogation because I didn't think that they were an endorsement of them. I think that Catherine Bigelow was sort of letting us know that they happened and showed them in such unflinching, you know, detail. Um, I, I'm surprised that it didn't get any. I guess it should. I guess I'm not surprised at the controversy. I just saw. It, I just saw it differently than anyone else. I, guess. I think Zero Dark Thirty doesn't have to be endorsing torture to still offer this message that oh, it was horrible and grim, but we did it and it was worth it and we got Bin Laden. Like the, it's more clever to have this veneer of sophistication that said, you know, not an. We can't accept World War Two era propaganda anymore because we would, think, you know. Um, like the Donald Duck short, uh, like Donald Duck is being harangued about paying for the war effort. Like that level of, of, of subtlety, like or lack of subtlety, we can't do that anymore. We wouldn't accept it. But now there is this whole new war. Oh, it's horrible and it's grim and it beats you up, but they're still like, but we're on the right side and we had to do it and it was I worth it. I think the most egregious uh, entertainment of that sort, even though I liked it, uh, was probably 24, uh, where it, it kept getting more ridiculous as it went along because they had to, you know, up the up the uh, ante. And by the end, you know, it's like every week Jack Bauer would be saying, like, I'm sorry, but we have to stick your child's head inside this hole to block the acid from coming out and killing everyone. A million people are going to die. I'm sorry, but it has to be done. It's just like it kept getting more ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the that was all about the, the ticking time bomb scenario that yeah. never happens. Never. Even held a gun on a surgical team in one episode and made them stop operating on a guy because he needed them to go work on a terrorist so they could save him and find out where the bomb was. God, I'm, I'm trying to never watch that show. It sounds so terrible. That's one thing, but just because, like, Clint Eastwood made a movie about Iraq War that wasn't, like, explicitly anti-American. I mean, it doesn't mean that it's, you know, super pro, rah, 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 patriotic. No. Unfortunately, the problem is most people in America are just so stupid that they can't actually examine a movie on its own merits. It has to tie into a million different things, usually just reinforcing their own biases. And I think the real problem is America's dumb. <laughs> I mean, there is this idea, like, um, the halfway terrible, halfway kind of entertaining movie Swing Kids, which also has Kenneth Branagh as a Nazi, which I was going to say, he plays a Nazi a lot. It's a little weird. He wants to narrate a thing about Eichmann. Goal. What? It was about, it was about Goebbels. Goal. About the Norse gods. Yeah, Goebbels, right, my bad. Okay, but the movie Swing Kids, I remember reading some of the criticism, it's like, well, it doesn't talk about the final solution at all. Well, no, it's supposed to be from the perspective of a bunch of, uh, from a perspective of a bunch of dumbass German teenagers who just like music and are trying to get away with listening to music they like without getting in trouble. I mean, it's movies are not supposed to be about everything just because they're at about a certain point in time. It's true. But 
I don't know. I mean, I, I think I have, I have to see the movie, but I think it is possible to be sort of bullshit even when you're being as sophisticated looking as Eastwood tends to be. And I do think that it sounds like Kyle was a really bad choice for this type of movie because you have to manufacture his regret, you know, and, and imply the, how heavy it all is with somebody who maybe he was full of shit about himself as much as he was full of shit about anything else, but he acted like he liked killing people and he didn't regret anything about any of it, which makes him a bad subject for this kind of movie and it makes it potentially a more dishonest movie. Maybe he just wanted to make some money. Eastwood, that is. He wanted to make a blockbuster. <laughs> yeah. If, if any uh, Zero Dark Thirty fans out there want to see Jessica Chastain do better acting, in my opinion, uh, she's currently in the quasi-gangster movie A Most Violent Year, uh, which I thought was really good, uh, in which she plays the wife of a guy who's trying to keep his business together in 1981 in New York City when crime was at its peak and he doesn't want to become a gangster. Uh, and uh, it's the first movie I've seen where I thought, oh, she really actually can act. She's not just pretty. Um, and uh, it, it's almost it's almost Randian, the way the guy's like trying to keep his integrity and keep the business together. And at the same time, it's sort of subtle in a 1970s French connection kind of way. And tragically... Uh, even though it's technically been out for about three weeks, it's only made eight hundred thousand dollars. So please go see a most violent year, which that, I did not produce okay. or anything. That was wild. <laughs> what, Joe? What? I said that was a crazy non sequitur. <laughs> well, that's what we keep Todd around for. Actually, that's what we keep like half of you around for. Honestly. Um, yeah. Honestly, I could do a whole pot. Maybe I should start a podcast about. Like, no, over, stop over analyzing that. things. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, this has been good. We'll discuss this later in our lives. Um, okay. Well, I'll see the movie tomorrow, and we'll see how it feels. Um, let's do a little bit of, even though Todd already sort of completed the segue by his having his movie tangent, what have we been enjoying in the last week or so that is not related to politics? Um, I'll start. I bought this on eBay for no reason because I like collecting morbid <laughs> artifacts. So I'm excited about that. It was a mere seven dollars. Wow. If I had a lot, um, it's it's cool. very informative. It really is. If I had a lot of money, I would buy very morbid thing historical artifacts on eBay. You can survive. Check it out. You can. It's okay. You can survive. Um, that's pretty much it. Joe, what have you been enjoying in the past week? Um, in the past week, I've listened to pretty much every album that's come out so far. Well, that's um, a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's all I do. In all of human history? Well, this year. Okay. And I have to say uh, I like Megan Trainor's album. It's cool. It's doo-wop and hip-hop. Her it's voice hip. is just excruciating. Is no, the, uh, no. You only heard that one person. Yes. Okay. No, the, the rest of it's much better. And um, God, Mark Ronson. So oh, many man. poor man's Amy Winehouses were spawned from Amy Winehouse. What? It's nothing to do with Amy Winehouse. <laughs> Take that back. No, fake, fake, fake. Uh, that era and the weird. There's like a whisper in all about the base of that voice. If Amy Winehouse sucked and mm. was a hack. So, yeah. More like hairspray style. It's just oh. hairspray. Basically. No, it's still bad. I also like Fall Out Boy's new album. Yeah, you would. I'm going to listen to the new Justin Towns role, which is supposed to be better than his last one, which was really underwhelming. And there's I a new Ralph that. Stan. Okay. With the newer one? From, like, now? Or the one from last year? Okay. Okay. The one that just came out, Lucy. Okay, fine. I told fine. you every album. <laughs> and there's a new Not Ralph Stan thing I'm going to listen to. So that's good. That'll be good. Music is good. Um, Chris, what have you been enjoying the last week that's not politics? Well, I've actually been enjoying and trying to write about this documentary I saw um, called Teenage, which came out last winter in theaters. Um, it's based on a history by uh, John Savage, who was one of the early punk writers in the 70s, like probably one of the first in the UK. Um, 
it's like 80 minutes long. It's not very long. And as far as the history of, you know, the creation of youth culture, it's kind of, it kind of skims over a lot. Um, but it covers like, you know, like, because you mentioned swing kids. This reminded me of that. You know, swing kids and kids who joined the Hitler Youth, um, mm -hmm. kids um, working for the CCC and the New Deal. Like, it goes from like 1904 to 1945 and develop, you know, and starts to trace how the modern teenager came to be um, and brings up um, America's involvement in the world wars and all that. And its basic point, which I found was interesting, was that uh, essentially, you know, the teenager was an American creation and somehow revolutionized the Western world, at least, um, in a positive way. Um, which I thought was very strange for, you know, an English writer to be making, because I mostly hear all these complaints about, you know, America giving all these annoying things, Starbucks and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And this is a, sort of like a positive spin on it. Mm -hmm. like, like American kids were more effective liberators of people than neocons ever were. <laughs> I'm not sure how true that is exactly. That's um, totally true. Because that's giving, that's giving us too much credit, I think. Um, but I thought that was a very, it was better than I thought it would be. And it's, it's done through, uh, like first person accounts. Like there are no talking heads. Like it's just actors reading from, you know, journal entries, memoirs, things like that. Like, like Jenna Malone is like the most famous voice actor there. I don't know. I thought it was good. I'm trying to sort of piece it together for an actual. It sounds good to me. Totally. Um, but yeah, but it talks about things like um, subdebs, which I'd never heard of, which were like you know American like middle class girls who were considered like a big you know demographic back then, um, and you know it talks about the White Rose and yeah. all these groups, and but it does also give sort of a sympathetic account to what it was like for people to join, say, the Hitler Youth and how sort of freeing that was amidst the chaos of, you know, the Great Depression and all that. I don't know. It's a lot to take in, and I enjoyed it. It's mm -hmm. on Hulu now. I enjoyed it more than I thought it would. I don't know why. I mean, that sounds like a thing that I would enjoy, so I don't know why you're not. Okay. Anyway, that sounds good. <laughs> oh, my brain is failing. Can I help you? How many people are taking? God, <laughs> uh, JL, what about you? What have you been doing in the last week? Um, I bought a couple of things for my kitchen. But if you mean like uh, media, what I've been enjoying, um, it's kind of related to politics. It's called the uh, Negroes in the Gun. Oh yeah, so, I meant to read that. Yeah, it's it's great. It's great. I mean, it's nothing to do with like I guess top like what's happening right now. Actually, it does technically. Um, let me think of, of a non-political thing that I could share with you. Um, oh, so season five of League of Legends started uh, uh, last week, uh, this week, and if any of you guys play vi video games, not, um, probably most of you don't. Um, yeah. So I play, I play, I play video games like Hearthstone and League of Legends and things of that nature. Yeah. I know Joe plays them sometimes, but he wandered off. My video game skills stopped. And, the and I just saw the finale yes. of Sailor Moon Crystal, and it was great. I had to yell at my roommate. because he... Everyone's yelling at Stagwalls right now, and they're ruining everything. And yeah. this, is, this is falling into madness and disarray. Okay. Yeah, so I watched the finale of um, Sailor Moon Crystal. So if, you're, if, you're, if, if you were a kid once and watch uh, Sailor Moon, the original one, um, you can watch Sailor Moon Crystal, which is a lot shorter version of that. It's like only 14 ep episodes. It's all on Hulu. Um, the, you know, it's like all updated, new uh, animation, short storyline from from the manga. Um, I don't know. I kind of I grew up watching Sailor Moon, and you know, if yeah, you know, I, I always told people like think of me as. Sailor Moon in personality. I like food a lot. I'm pretty bad at school and kind of clumsy sometimes, you know. And I like cat. I have a cat. <laughs> yeah. I um, 
But yeah, I mean, it's a, it's 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 a great show, I think. Um, primarily because it's like, it's like unintentionally feminist, maybe. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, I doubt the 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 lady. Actually, I don't I don't know the 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 lady who created Sailor Moon. Um, I think she 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 intentionally you know created a a feminist cartoon, but it isn't like I mean she's still a normal girl. She likes you know she likes food. She talks about being fat all the time and. You know, like not eating enough or whatever, or not eating too much, for example. And she cries about boys. And, yeah. What's that? Um. And yeah. So I thought uh, it's it's a good. Thing. Just like every other girl in the whole world. Shut every up, Joe. Girl in the whole world, except she's a she's a moon princess. Yeah. I wish I was a moon princess. Not really. Yeah. Uh, like you God. can be a moon princess. I'll try. I it's will try. <laughs> So there's that. That's uh, I guess. Uh, yeah. Right. I mean, I, I wish I, I wish I wish I'm reading like uh, uh, a a non fic Oh, sorry, a fiction book that's that has nothing to do with politics, though. If uh, anyone has a recommendation, let mm. me know. All I'm reading is weird books about the history of civil defense and weird things like that. More depressing apocalypse shenanigans. C uh, V, what about you? Uh, let's see. I read four good books, but now that I think about it, they're all political. Damn you. Uh, so that's useless. <laughs> uh, uh, but I will say, actually, back on the movie thing, that uh, it was interesting. Over the past few months, uh, I saw what I thought were several good movies, and I was totally unable to predict which ones would make money and which ones wouldn't. Uh, so, for instance, I saw Birdman, and I thought, okay, that's good, but I'm not sure anybody's going to see this thing. And then it actually did okay. Mm. Uh, by contrast, uh, Jason Reitman, who's the son of Ivan Reitman. Ivan directed Ghostbusters. Jason dire directed uh, Juno, amongst other things. Uh, he had a movie that I thought was comparably good called Men, Women, and Children uh, that was the most ambitious attempt I've seen to capture how social media has transformed people's family and sex lives, which may sound like a really obvious topic, but I haven't seen anybody else really try to capture it in a two-hour dramatic form. I don't think I want to see that in a two-hour dramatic form is the problem, because I don't uh, think I, I care that much. I thought he did a good job of it, though, and uh, and in a way he is good. I mean, I like his stuff. And in a way that made, you, in particular, there was like a sort of an opening sequence that showed high school students having conversa conversations simultaneously with texting uh, toward like people who are on the fringes of the conversation uh, behind each other's backs, and it made you feel like, oh, even though I knew this is part of life, it does kind of look weird and sci-fi like when you step back and think about it, and mm. that again made like one million dollars or seven hundred thousand dollars or something, uh, yeah. and. Uh, and then uh, Interstellar did really well, but, you know, I also liked the Jeremy uh, Renner movie, um, Kill the Messenger, about uh, CIA drug smuggling, and again, that made like $200,000 or something, or $2 million, I think, but, you know, did not do well. Uh, so it was interesting that, you know, there were a bunch of potential Oscar bait kind of artsy movies uh, toward the end of the year, as there always is now, and I was not really good at predicting which ones would do well and which ones would do poorly. Um, but uh, but I've seen almost all of them, so that's good. At least I'm having fun. The market is a fickle mistress, or something. Oh, speaking like of which, uh, that, that reminds me that there was actually a Heinlein movie uh, that I wanted to see, uh, which might still be in some big cities. Uh, it's probably only showing in like the one art house theater in each uh, each big city. But uh, the famous Heinlein uh, time travel story, All You Zombies, has been adapted into the movie Predestination, and mm. uh, so it finally got here from Australia. And gosh darn it, I was, as I often do, I was attentively watching to see where it was going to show so I could go to the one theater in Manhattan and see it. And then I get there, and when I go to buy my ticket in like 17 degrees weather, uh, they tell me, oh, we should warn you, that screening room has no heat. <laughs> so, so I didn't buy the ticket. And then I'm thinking, like, I wonder if the movie distributors even know that this problem is happening at the one theater. And oh, sure enough, it closes after one week, probably because nobody wanted to sit in the freezing theater. So now that's gone, and I didn't get to see Predestination, <laughs> unless I travel back in time. <laughs> or piracy. By contrast, there's a, an Iranian female-directed vampire movie uh, yeah, that's supposed to be good. A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night. That, too, is only showing in one theater in Manhattan. And two months after it came out, it sold out every night, which I think is kind of amazing. Todd, as much as I'm impressed by the fact that there was no heating in a movie theater anywhere, um, <laughs> you are not allowed to complain about a lack of cultural options when you live in New York City, and I don't. I mean, that's what you trade for having to live in New York City, is that you get sweet things like that. But still, come on. 
Instead yeah. of your parents' basement. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's a great city over here. Um, city of shame. Thanks, thanks, Joe. I hate you all except JL and Todd and Chris. <laughs> no, that's that's right. Anyway, all right. Promote yourselves real quick. Let's let's wrap up this hellscape. Uh, Joe, what should the people do with your works? Um, I don't know. I'm gonna start a music feature on the Stag blog. Maybe, probably not. But I'd like to. Cool. Sounds good. Uh, JL, what about you? Follow me on Twitter. Uh, oh, yeah. Follow me on Twitter uh, at Ahram A H E R A M. Um, I rage tweet a lot, and sometimes I'm very offensive. Yes, that's uh, good. And occasionally I do hate on libertarians. Uh, <laughs> it's like a once a week occurrence. Oh, oh at, the, at this point, it's like a once a week occurrence. You know, there's something about libertarians that just makes me like just like rage, like rage, and. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's like the racist bullshit that they post on on Facebook or something. Yeah. So there's reasons to rage. It's true. Be yeah. be like Angela Keaton and and hate the libertarians while being the best libertarian. That's a good life goal. That's I think. Awesome. Yeah. Chris, what about you? Um. Well, I haven't updated the biopsy site in a while, aside from the farewell post. But if anyone wants to check it out. It's biopsymag.com, and I, too, spend too much time on Twitter, which is at CR underscore Morgan. So, yeah, and I share whatever I write whenever it goes up, which is, you know, every couple of months or so. All right, then. I'll link to all you jerks' as Twitters. Um, oh, and CV, where should the people read your works? I would say uh, if you Google my name, uh, you'll find me on uh, Facebook, Blogger, and Twitter. And uh, if you friend me on Facebook, just send me a message so I know you're not a spam bot, basically. <laughs> uh, and most of this year, it looks like I'm going to be uh, ghostwriting stuff. Um, but I might have a book with my own name on the cover, <laughs> so I'll get back to you about that if it works out. Yay! We'll you write good. I like I'll it. Like that. Um, <laughs> And the thing. All right, yeah, people can read my stuff at Vice in Anti War and sometimes the Stag blog and rare when I get back to that. Um, yeah. Oh, and my God, go look at liberty.me because I think it costs a mere $5 a month now, which is a pretty solid, affordable thing. And thank you to Chris and JL and Joe and CV. Um, thank you, future audience. Hopefully, we'll do this again sometime real soon. Bye, guys. Bye.